Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this afternoon's seminar, which uh, will be given by Dimitra de Chico, who is from the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile. And for today's talk, she'll be um, telling us about uh, variability studies of AGN towards the LSST era. Um, Dimitra, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm really happy to be with you, so just virtually. <laughs> so thanks. Well, um, during the past nine years by now, I've been studying AGN mostly. And um, I have a very specific reason for that, because I still remember the time when I realized I wanted to study AGM for the rest of my life. And it was because I, I realized that whatever wavelength you choose to investigate them, you will find amazing properties. And also what I thought was really, really awesome is the existence of a connection between the host galaxy and its central black hole as proven by several properties that, I mean, the well-known empirical properties. Um, for, um, for AGN and black, connecting AGN and, um, and black holes. So, um, in particular, my work focuses on AGN selection, uh, and this is a pretty hard task because there are several ways to do it, but none of them is exhaustive. And so basically you can do it in different ways, but you will always be biased towards and against something, and you will have overlapping samples in the end with some gaps. So for example, if you ideally you would like to use X-rays to select a GN because this is the, um, the best way to find them because of their highly penetrating emission because uh, they vary on short time scales and vary with large amplitude. But of course, X-ray observatories are, are expensive and at present we don't have very wide fields of view. So an alternative could be spectroscopy, but the problem here is that you will be able to find AGN characterized by broad and prominent emission lines, but you will miss those AGN with the narrower lines, weaker lines, okay? And uh, also this is typically a time-consuming technique. So another alternative is to use colors in the ultraviolet, optical, infrared, but then you won't be able to find those AGN whose emission is dominated by the host galaxy contribution. And another option is uh, variability because it characterizes AGN at all time scales, basically, uh, at all, sorry, at all wavelengths, um, and covers uh, more than 20 orders of magnitudes in frequency. So basically, uh, you see AGN varying with time scales and uh, amplitudes that depend on the wavelength you are observing. Nowadays, we generally believe that these variations originated from the accretion disk surrounding the central black hole, and in particular from um, instabilities in the accretion flow and variations in the accretion rate. And uh, we can use this property, the properties of variability, to constrain the, um, the size and the structure of the emitting region. Now we can have variations on time scales of minus two years, uh, depending on the properties of the disk and on the wavelength. But in our case, in my works, I mostly use optical, I mean, I'm mostly interested in optical variability. So we are talking about time scales on the order of days to months or years with typical variations, uh, I mean, with typical amplitude of several tenths of, of uh, magnitude. In the past decade, there have been several surveys investigating optical variability. Um, so basically, the properties of these surveys also uh, affect the results. So we can have um, them affected by the, the length of the baseline, the, the depth of the survey, the bands that you use, and so on. And um, one of the advantages of uh, using optical variability and preferring it to other techniques is that it helps identify those AGN that are missed by X-ray surveys because they have an unusually low X-ray emission. Also, variability, optical variability helps to explore large areas which is currently not possible with X-ray or deep infrared surveys. And in principle, we should be able to find low luminosity AGN because there is a well-known correlation between the variability amplitude and the luminosity of um, of AGN. So in my works, I have mostly used the data from the VST survey telescope. Now, as I am from Naples, Italy, and this telescope is housed in Chile, I am particularly proud of it because this is the result of a collaboration between the observatory that we have in Naples and, uh, and the European Southern Observatory. You can see that it has a primary mirror of 2.65 meters. And I think the, the nicest feature, the, what I like most is the field of view of one square degree because it allows you to map a one square degree area with one single pointing. Imagine that when you want to map the same area 
with um, an X-ray telescope uh, like Chandra, uh, you, you need, I think, like 80 pointings to cover it. So in particular, my uh, work uses data from the VST uh, uh, observations of the cosmos field. Now, cosmos is one of the most widely surveyed areas in the sky, so there's plenty of coverage. There's an excellent coverage in basically every wavelength you need. And um, originally, this survey was, uh, was, uh, was tailored to detect supernovae and investigate the ratio of, of different supernova types and their evolution. But it turned out to be um, a really appealing test ground survey for AGM variability studies. In particular, we are putting effort into the development of reliable tools uh, for um, AGN selection in view of the wide field surveys to come, and especially um, the um, surveys from the Vera Rubin Observatory. Since I work in Chile, I might be biased towards it, but we are really waiting for, for the LSSC, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And so, as you can see from what I wrote here, basically our survey is a scaled down version of what we will have with the LSST, covering, of course, as a, a smaller area. And so far, we have also a shorter baseline because we have 3.3 years, but we actually have observations scheduled for next semester, so it's going to be longer. We have observations in three bands, G, R, and I, and um, the cadence is different. We, uh, mostly, I, I work on with R band data because they have a three-day observing cadence, depending, of course, on some observational constraints. So in the end, I have 54 visits. And what is maybe the most interesting feature of this uh, data set is the single visit depth of 23.5 magnitudes in the R band, which is basically the same that we will have with the LSST. So this data set is at present one of the few that can take advantage of a considerable depth, um, an extended baseline, and um, a good observing cadence. So in my first work in 2015, uh, we were searching for AGN candidates using a traditional approach. So basically, we had 27 observations over five months, just five months. And for every source, we had a light curve. So we computed its average um, magnitude, the corresponding RMS, and we define a variability threshold as the three sigma threshold. And so the sources about this threshold were assumed to be our AGN candidates. And we visually inspected all of them, okay, because uh, we uh, wanted to get rid of spurious sources. Now, this is, of course, something you cannot think of doing with larger data sets. Anyway, we had a sample of 83 AGN candidates with that work. Then when we had uh, an extended data set with 3.3 years covered, um, we could find many more AGN. Okay, we we had 299 AGN candidates, and the approach was pretty much the same. But here, the threshold is defined by the 95th percentile of the RMS distribution. And uh, since we had excellent multivariant coverage, as I mentioned, we could validate our candidates by means of several diagnostics. Now, we mostly used the X-ray and mid-infrared data in this case, and you can see here the diagram comparing. Uh, X-ray and optical fluxes of our sources. Typically, AGN are above this line here, and you can see that most of our AGN, well, just one is out here, uh, are above this line in both cases. So this confirmed a large fraction of our candidates, 84%, with the longest baseline. And then we use this diagnostic comparing medium for red colors. Uh, where we actually have two different selections here, because if we refer to the, the region defined by we will have a GN according to Lacey et al. 27, uh, 2007, but there is some contamination here by star forming galaxies. And so we generally refer to uh, Donnelly et al. 2012, which uh, identified this region delimited by the dashed line. And here we have a purer selection of AGN. So we usually refer to this one to be um, more confident that our sources are indeed AGN. One interesting thing that we noticed comparing the two works, well, uh, when we have a, a five-month baseline, uh, we saw that most of the sources with an X-ray counterpart, 85% of them, were below the variability threshold. Now, this was somehow surprising because these X-ray sources, by construction of the, the X-ray catalog, were supposed to be mostly AGN, because this is a catalog of bright point-like sources. So we thought that maybe this was because we weren't able to detect large variations with the baseline that we had, the five-month baseline. And so we thought that extending the baseline, we could have more sources jumping above this line, this threshold. And indeed, this is what happened. Because now, uh, with the 3.3-year baseline, we have 59% of our sources above the threshold, which is encouraging, I mean, considering the first result that we have. 
Okay, once we did this, we decided to switch to machine learning. It was about time to switch to something automated. And so we put considerable effort into the development of a reliable, automated, uh, reproducible method to search for AGN in view of future surveys. And we also um, tested the use of different label sets to, um, to do this classification. I'm talking about label sets because we uh, will use um, a classification based on a random forest. So we are talking about the supervised learning domain, which means that uh, basically, um, basically a random forest classifier is, um, is based on the use of decision trees. It builds thousands of uncorrelated decision trees and it needs to, to be trained to learn how to separate uh, one type of source from another. I'm not going into much detail, but please ask me if you're interested. Um, so basically we needed to build this um, random forest classifier and uh, we needed to feed it uh, with a set of features. So we decided to use some typical variability features to ones like the structure function parameters, then random walk parameters and so on. And also a set of features that come from the FATS Python library that was developed specifically uh, to investigate for feature extraction from astronomical light curves to investigate time series in general. And also we uh, use a morphology indicator a feature that comes from the, the Cosmos catalog by the Hubble Space Telescope and basically it separates extended sources from point-like sources. So we had this set of features and we um, decided to see what happened um, with different label sets. And before doing, so we need to define a label set, okay, and our classification at this stage is binary. So we select AGN and we separate AGN from non-AGN. And so we needed a sample of non-AGN known some, somehow from the literature and a sample of AGN. We included in the non-AGN both stars and galaxies that we assume to be non-active, inactive. So building the star sample was pretty easy, easy because we uh, have several Cosmos catalogs with a classification. We cross-match all, all, the, all the catalogs that we had to be sure, to be, to be confident that there was no conflicting classification. And we also uh, plotted our sources on a diagram comparing these two colors, R minus Z, and Z minus K, where you typically have a stellar sequence. So we wanted to be sure that these sources were not in weird places. And also uh, we had this sample of inactive galaxies. This was a bit harder to find, but we again cross-checked several catalogs. So we avoided conflict classification and we selected all the galaxies for which we had no known classification as active. So no, no sign of nuclear activity. And also there was a classification based on best fit templates classifying them as non-active. So we were pretty confident that this was a good sample. And then we selected the GN by means of different properties. And that's why we could build different label sets for our tests, because we have a sample of AGN selected via spectroscopy and classified as type one. So S is for spectroscopy and one is for type one. A sample of type two AGN again from spectroscopy. And then we have a sample of sources selected by the diagnostic that I showed here. Okay, the diagram by Donnelly et al. from 2012. So um, we had this sample of AGN and we used the full sample for, for one of our tests and the various subsamples for other tests while we keep the same, always the same sample of non-AGN for our selection. So here, here you can see results from the confusion matrices that we obtained from our random forest classifiers testing different label sets. And so on top of each one, you can see the label sets that we used, the DIGN label set that we used. So for example, here we have type one, type two, here we have both. And so this is a spectroscopic selection, while here, for example, we have all of them. Okay, here we have a bright selection of spectroscopic AGN, brighter than 21 in the R band. And here we have the mid infrared selection. And if you look at this table, you can see that the, here, we have the highest fraction of sources that are correctly classified, meaning that their true labels, so what we know that they are based on the literature and on our catalogs, uh, is the same as what is predicted from the classifier. So this is confirming us that type 1 AGN are ideally the best to, to I mean, are, are the, the, use, the, the best class to build this kind of classifier. This is not really surprising, you know, because optical variability is biased toward this type of AGN. So we somehow expected these were a favor label set. Anyway, we went on with our tests. Um, once we decided to use this AGN, type 1 AGN for our label set, we introduced colors. We introduced U, B, R, I, Z, and Y colors because this will be available with the LSSC. And so it was interesting to see if introducing color features would lead to some um, significant, some substantial change and improvement in our classification. 
So here you see the results from five classifiers where we progressively added colors. So here we add I minus Z and Z minus Y. Here we are three colors using these bands and so on. Okay, and in the RFI we use the full set of colors. And if you compare these numbers, you don't see a dramatic difference between each other, I mean among each other. So in the end, we decided that uh, the RF5 classifier uh, gave slightly better results. And so using the full set of color would be a good choice. Also here, you can find results uh, from a test where we don't use variability features, but we use just colors. And I will discuss this in a while. Um, oh, here I have these boxes that move somehow, sorry. But uh, what I wanted to show with this, well, this is the, um, the feature importance ranking. So it tells us, um, which is the most important feature, and then it goes, it goes down to the less important. Okay, and um, you can see that the most important features with the a classifier using only type one AGN are the ones typical of typically describing AGN variability. While the first color that you find is here, so this box was supposed to be here. Sorry. Um, so this is the first color that you see in the ranking, and it's the ninth position, I guess. And then you see the others that are even. Um, in at a lower ranking. So basically, colors are not very important in this classification. And so we wanted to investigate why this happens. I'll go back to this in a minute. Um, wait, okay. Uh, so um, these are some metrics that characterize the random forest classifier and helped us uh, realize, I mean, confirmed us that uh, the random forest classifier using the full set of colors is the best because this basically um, allow you to how says how good is the performance of the classifier. So for example, the accuracy tells you how often the classification, both for AGN and non-AGN is correct. While uh, this is kind of the purity, basically it tells you how often you are good at classifying AGN correctly, how good you are classifying AGN correctly. And this is the completeness. It tells you how good you are in retrieving non-AGN. Okay, while this, is, uh, uh, this uh, combines uh, purity and completeness, basically, taking into account misclassification. In the end, if you look at these indicators, this, the values for these metrics here, um, the RF5 turns out to have the best results. And so this confirmed, once again, that the full set of features was the, the best choice. Uh, we also wanted to see what happened uh, to the, um, the feature importance change in the label set. So, for example, here is the label set that we use in the end. And you can see that there are no colors among the top five features that are here. The same happens with a spectroscopic sample, but full sample, both a bright sample, okay, and the full sample down to 23.5 magnitude. That that is our current limit, our current depth. You don't see colors here, but when this is because these samples are generally dominated in our case by type 1 AGN. But if you start introducing type 2 AGN, like here in the infrared, you will see colors. And the same happens with, when you use the full sample of AGN, you have a color that is the, the top feature. So colors become important when you use different label sets. And so that's what I wanted to say earlier. Um, we uh, investigated why this happens, why colors are not very important in some cases. Um, so these are the top two variability features that we have with our classifier. And you can see the distributions of the sources in our label set. So type 1, type 2, mid infrared selected AGN, stars, and inactive galaxies. And what you can easily see is that type 1 AGN have a different distribution separated from the others, peaking in a different place. Okay, and the same happens here for the excess variance. While if you look at colors, the top two colors in the ranking, you see that the various distributions have sometimes peaks that are quite separated from each other, but the overlap among the distributions is pretty large. And so this is why we are not able to disentangle properly the various classes of AGN using these colors. Um, okay, once we have our classic, we define which classifier we wanted to use, uh, we uh, obtain a sample of AGN candidates, and uh, you can see them here on, on each of these color diagrams. We used all the colors available. Um, you can see them as filled circles, while the empty circles represent our label set. In gray, you have stars, and in green, you have inactive galaxies. Now, what you can see from each of these diagrams is that our, some, our AGN candidates are systematically um, shifted towards redder colors compared to the label set. And this is tell, it's telling us something important because it's, it's stating, it's suggesting that variability is uh, effective in the identification of host dominated AGN because we are looking at redder galaxies, so galaxies where the contribution from the host it becomes more dominant. And this is important because this is where colors alone typically fail. Um, we did another test uh, using a different label set, spectroscopic sample of bright AGN 
okay, uh, brighter than 21 in the R band. And we cross matched the sample of AGN candidates obtained with this label set and the sample obtained with um, using a type 1 AGN for the label set. And you can see here, the matched sources are the ones, ones in common. The unmatched sources are the ones that with this new classifier we cannot find. But you can, uh, this, this thing that I'm showing here, this, this plots and histograms show, uh, hold for each color that we, we used. Basically, we don't have a specific uh, um, tendency, uh, I mean, a specific trend to extend towards the bluer or redder colors in, in none of these two cases. So basically, we are looking at the same type of sources. And here as well, you don't see that these two samples of sources um, are somehow characterized by different colors. They are mingle basically and so this is telling us that using this label set does not prevent us from finding AGN with uh, with redder colors and this is important because you know in view of uh, of the LSSC and of future surveys in general especially in the beginning we won't be able to have large extended samples of uh, spectroscopically confirmed AGN uh, especially at fainter magnitudes okay it will be really hard to have them and so this is this is suggesting that um, I mean, this is supporting the idea that uh, even a bright sample of spectroscopic AGN is good in finding fainter AGN and also uh, with red colors. I, I didn't show their magnitude here, but they cover the full uh, range investigated. Um, okay, I mentioned that I did a test using just colors. Well, the result, results were quite a disaster because basically I did this test with different AGN label sets and I got samples that were one order of magnitude larger than usual samples that I got. I showed these two color diagrams here as an example to, to, to show where these sources place themselves. Basically, they, they are spread. Here, generally, you find stars according to this selection that we have using just colors. This should be AGN candidates. So we cannot really show that this is contamination, but it, it is very likely. And it, we're talking about at least 20% contamination, depending on the label set that you use. And we also compared our sample of AGN candidates obtained here with this test with the known sample of AGN that we use for our label set here in red. We have a variability feature, a color, and the morphology feature. And you can see that in every panel, in each panel, the distributions are different. So we, I suppose that if we are finding AGN, the distribution should be similar to the one of the other AGN, unless this AGN has some peculiar properties that we don't know of. But given also the large fraction of contaminants, this seems quite unlikely. And so we decided that variability, I mean, this stresses the importance of variability over the use of colors alone. Uh, we did another test uh, using, um, introducing a medium infrared color. Now we called it CH21 because it's the difference between these two channels, the magnitude in, this, in these two bands, um, these two IREC bands from Spitzer. So um, this should help uh, disentangle a type 2 or medium infrared selected AGN. So we uh, show here the, uh, the feature importance ranking for uh, the um, this classifier built using only type 1 AGN without this color and with this color, the star marks the difference here. You can see that the, this feature is the third one in the ranking. So not dramatically important, but still pretty much. And if you look at this other test where we use the full set of AGN for the label set, this feature becomes the first one and is way more important than the others. So this is suggesting that including mid infrared colors would be really helpful in finding uh, um, type 2 or medium infrared AGN, as also shown here from this histogram, where you can see that the distributions um, related to these colors start to show a larger separation. Of course, it's not, it will not be easy to have these colors at a good depth for the, the 18,000 square degrees that will be covered by the LSST, but we still have some shallow data and time to figure it out, hopefully. So um, this is a summary of the first, first part of our work, where basically you can see that you get the highest, the highest purity uh, using a pure sample of AGN and using this medium infrared color. And so this is basically telling us that if we want to obtain a pure sample of AGN, we need to use a pure label set. While if we are interested in a high completeness, we should use a sample that is uh, that is um, as heterogeneous as possible. So include more AGN types in the label set so that the classifier can learn how to separate them. And this is the, these are the results from the GQ et al 2019. And so you can see that we have just a 5% improvement in terms of purity, but 
um, nine, ten percent improvement in terms of completeness, but this unfortunately affects mostly type one AGN because type two AGN are really hard to find the optic availability. So this is still an issue for us, an open issue. Um, we could uh, estimate, um, we could provide some lower limit expectations for the LSST based on our dataset because we can compute the number of AGN that we found were one square degree, combining together the candidates and the known AGN in our label sets. And this translates into more than 6 million AGN that we expect to find via optical variability in the 18,000 square degrees that will be covered by domain survey. But this is, of course, a lower limit because this survey is expected to be much better than ours. Also, we uh, tested what happens use, uh, with variations in three bands um, at the same time or in two bands. And so we found 3.3 million in the first case and uh, 4 to 5 million approximately with, ju with just two bands. So now that we have all these, these sets of AGN that we found via different diagnostics, we thought we could use them to build a larger sample of AGN. We have 677 in a one square degree and investigate their ensemble properties via the structure function. So you can see here our samples together. I mean, this is the full sample and we have the various sub samples. Um, these areas, of course, are not um, quantitatively significant, but you can see that there is a large overlap among most of them, but the X-ray sample is the one with less uh, overlapping and this is because we are not able to to find some of these sources via um, the variability okay we're not complete in that sense but with a longer baseline we could find more as i showed so basically uh, for 91 percent of these sources we have a spectroscopic redshift which helps uh, when we want to build the structure function um we want to we also want to investigate where uh, okay well our data set is um, deeper than most of the data sets that we were using in the literature to investigate the structural function usually they stop at a magnitude of 22.5 or, or 22 while we go down to 23.5 so basically our idea was to test if the properties of the structural function that we find in the literature still hold when we go deeper okay and we also investigated what happens using different samples of AGN to build the structural function and uh, we investigate the, the correlation between the variability pro and um, some uh, main of the main properties of the, the central black hole, meaning its black hole mass and the accretion rate that is quantified by the editor ratio. So basically, there are a lot of ways to build a structure function. A structure function essentially um, can characterize the variability of a full sample, giving you a set of points that are uncorrelated. While if you look at a single light curve, you will have results that are correlated between the different the, the various time lags. Basically, what you do is to measure a rest frame time difference. And you do it from every light curve of every each light curve of each source. You compute all the time differences between the various epochs and the corresponding magnitude difference. And then there are a bunch of definitions from the literature slightly different from each other. I decided to use this one because here you compute this difference, then you average it, and then you square it. And this means that you are reducing the contribution of the outliers here. While this is um, a term quantifying the noise that you have. And so if we subtract this term properly, we ideally should look at, should only be looking at intrinsic variations. So you can see here in gray, the whole set of points that we obtained for our structure function. And then we bin this over time ranges, and then we get the, the black points that you can see here. If you want more details about how I estimate the noise, uh, I will tell you later. So, um, we built the structure function for the various samples of AGN that we use in our work so far. And uh, you, uh, you can see here our best results obtained for type 1 AGN and for uh, sample selectivity via optic availability. This is pretty much the same because this sample is highly biased towards type 1 AGN. So basically, you, here you see the typical behavior of a structure function, a region where you don't really see variations. You have larger error bars, and this is because we are looking at very short time scales, so not enough to detect large variations in the optical. And then you have a linear region. We have a logarithmic axis, both of them. And you have a drop here that is not something real, but is related to the lack of uh, adequate sampling at these uh, baselines. You see two colors here because I wanted to uh, compare the structural functions at two different depths to see if there were any substantial differences. And we computed the slopes for these two regions. And you can see that these results are fairly consistent with some results from the literature that are actually even more that I didn't mention. Um, conversely, if you use type 2 AGN, you basically obtain much larger error bars. I plotted these lines just because I wanted to show what happens in the same time range used for these plots here. But of course, 
these are not significant at all. In principle, you could fit the whole set of points with a line here and very large scatter, of course, um, very large errors. So basically, that two AGN are flattening our structure function. They give us, they return a much shallower structure function. And when we start introducing them into our sample of AGN, their contribution will be more important for shortened time scales. And you can see here, that you can still see a linear region. Here, when we have more and more type 2 AGN included in the sample, you, it's, it's harder to see a linear region. These two samples are almost the same. And you have a, a very large region with, um, I mean, with large variations, but I mean, larger or bars and not, not large variations. So uh, once we investigated this, we wanted to, to investigate possible correlations between the variability uh, and um, the black hole mass and the editor ratio, as I mentioned. So we could estimate these properties. I mean, we got estimates from different catalogs that you see listed here. And we have 264 sources with an estimate of black hole mass and editor ratio. So we dropped the X-ray sample for this study because the number is pretty much the same, you see. And we also dropped the sample of type 2 AGN because these sources are not variable enough to be interesting. I mean, I, this doesn't mean we are not using these sources. We are not investigating these samples alone. So what we did, uh, oh yeah, I wanted to show this, sorry. Uh, this shows you uh, the range that we covered in terms of black hole mass compared to some of the um, or some other works investigating the structure function. And you can see that we are covering broader ranges, okay, which is good because we are, we are moving towards the lower end, even though we don't have many data here yet. So once we have our um, samples of sources with black hole mass estimates, we take each sample. I showed just the full sample here, but we do it for each one of them. We split the sample in two based on the median value of the black hole mass. And so we will have a sample of sources in red with lower black hole mass and a sample with higher black hole mass values. Here in the bottom panels, you see a zoom in on the linear region. What you can see from here is that the slopes in each pair are not very different from each other, but the sources with a higher black hole mass are systematically higher, so characterized by a higher, higher variability amplitude with respect to the others. Um, you know, black hole mass dependency is still controversial in the based on the literature. There are some works claiming that there is a correlation, some claiming that this is not real, but it's the result of other dependencies. So we could not answer this question yet at this stage. We still have uh, unclear results here. We also tested what happened. Um, I mean, we wanted to see if the editor ratio affected, affects this result to some extent. So we selected a sample of sources very close to the peak of the editor ratio distribution so in, in surroundings of this peak in this region. So the editor ratio varied just a little, but it's just a little, and we can assume it to be roughly constant. And so we did the same kind of analysis, splitting each sample in two, but in the end, we got the same result. Basically, we don't see different slopes, but we see different amplitudes depending on the mass. We did the same thing with, um, with the editor ratio distributions. Uh, so we dropped the type two and the X-ray samples of sources and analyzed the remaining four. And uh, here is the distribution of our editor ratio values compared to the same works as before. And once again, we are covering a broader range of, uh, of values. And we did the same thing. We split the sample in two based this time on the median editor ratio. And what you can see from here, from the zoom in linear on the linear regions, is that the sources with a lower editor ratio seem to be characterized by a steeper, um, a steeper, vari a steeper line. So we have um, these sources seem to be more variable, even though this is not striking. You can see it from the slopes of, of the various lines. Okay, it's not a dramatic difference, but still this is here. And it's also confirmed from the same test that we did before, choosing this time a sample of sources around the black hole mass, the peak of the black hole mass distribution. So a sample of sources with a roughly constant black hole mass. And so uh, this is consistent with most of the works from the literature that suggest that the editor ratio is um, a dri the driver, the main driver for AGM variability, even though, again, our results are, um, are weaker. I, I mean, are weak, okay? In the literature, they are not always striking, but this might also be an effect of the, um, the depth that we are investigating. So basically, if when we will have a longer baseline, we could investigate this further and see if this leads to some more change. But to this stage, we can just say that this is um, a weak correlation, anti-correlation that we find between the variability amplitude and the editor ratio. So basically, uh, we can conclude saying that our structure function analysis uh, show that the shape of the structure function does not seem to be affected from the depth of the sample, but it is affected 
by the type of AGN that you use to build it. And this leads to the question about type 2 variability. If this, we cannot detect it because of the structure of, um, of the agenda, because of how we are looking at them, or if there is some intrinsic difference because we don't see variations at all, at all while we do detect the emission. And okay, and then here there, there are the results that I just showed about black hole mass and energy ratio. So I think that I, I can stop. And any question is welcome. Thank you very much. I'll clap on behalf of everyone. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. And so I'll open the floor for questions. You can just raise your hand or um, if you want to, you can also put your question in the chat box. Okay, I see there's a question from Hartmut. You can go ahead. Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a, first of all, uh, just a general uh, question and then also a comment. Uh, I was trying to get some idea, uh, what is, how far are these AG? In other words, what is the, the redshift on average or do they just cover sort of complete range from, uh, and, uh, and also how bright are they? Because I see you've got the limit of about R is equal to 21. Does that mean they're all around about 20 or are they qu uh, quite a few brighter ones? Uh, well, their redshift, uh, okay, most of them have a redshift, a redshift lower than one, but they extend also, also to uh, three points, I mean, just a bit below four, basically. Uh, that's our redshift distribution, but most of them have redshift uh, around one, okay, so not really far away. And the other question was about the, their um, magnitude, you mean? Or the uh, luminosity. Yes, we, yeah. So that I was trying to get an idea about uh, how bright they are in general, but I suppose it, it goes together with it. Yeah. Uh, well, their magnitude goes down to twenty three point five. And actually, if you want to see the luminosity, I I think I could, I could open. I should not stop sharing, but I can show you from a paper. Actually, I have the distributions, but I didn't want to put too much stuff in here. So I have histograms here from last year's paper. And so I can show you. But basically, we go down to 23.5 and we have a lot of sources. And then we have volumetric luminosity computed for, for these sources. If this, this doesn't take too long, of course, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we're there. Okay, so here is the luminosity. Type 1 AGN are in green here. Type 2 are in red, so uh -huh. you can see they are... Um, less luminous and mid infrared selection is in black here. So altogether they make our sample. And here are also red shifts. So you can see that most of our oh, right, yes, sources yes. is here, but then we go down. This was just one, okay, so I didn't even mention, but we are below four basically. Okay. okay. Uh, then my, my, my point about it, okay, what you showed was that the, um, the brighter or rather the, the more massive the black hole is, the more variation you get. But wouldn't that just mm -hmm. in effect that if you have a smaller black hole, it's likely to be less luminous. In other words, the, the contribution from the actual galaxy is going to be so much bigger. And the end result is that if you look at the variation in magnitude, the variation is going to look smaller, even though percentage wise, if you could somehow isolate the AG, AGN, they might be varying with exactly the same amount. So it's really just a case that the the, the less luminous ones are just are being masked. And that's also why you probably don't see too much happening in the, in the, in the type twos. Yeah, this is actually one of the things that are puzzling me and keep puzzling me because I basically thought the same, same thing that you mentioned and this is still an open issue. So this paper is almost ready for submission, but I need to understand what happens here. Also because sometimes you find the opposite results from the literature, you know, so. I am a bit puzzled, but I mean, these are my data. This is what they show. So I, I don't know yet how to handle this, but yeah. I, yeah. I should I mean, investigate it farther. I could somehow will investigate the luminosity. Bright, yeah, I mean, the ideal thing is if you can somehow estimate how bright the host galaxy is, and you might be able to do that uh, just uh, from the redshifts. In other words, if you can somehow uh, come up with some sort of estimate of how much light is actually coming from the host galaxy and then subtract yeah. it. Uh, yeah, that is object. actually a good idea, a good suggestion, yeah. And also I should investigate the luminosity and dependencies from that because on, on the luminosity, because this could help to see if the luminosity is one of the, driver, the drivers and affect what I see with black hole masses, because sometimes this is the case and then you, you misinterpret what you see, basically. 
because you have two variables affecting it, but you think it's just one. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you for the suggestion too. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I'm, I like working on multi-wavelength analyses of AGN, but I'm not so familiar on the variability side. So maybe this is a, a silly question, but um, how do you disentangle variation that's due to the accretion disk from variation in the host galaxy, like if it's undergoing a starburst event or something? Because that would also affect the optical magnitudes. Yeah, uh, that could be an issue. In principle, we should include um, starburst galaxies in our label set. Indeed, this is one of the next steps, because if you include this as a different class or just as a non-AGN, your classifier could be able to, to separate them. At this stage, we didn't do it because it turns out to be doing a pretty good job. I mean, 91% purity means it's working. I guess yeah. the type of variability is different because AGN variability is, um, well, it has a typical red noise, so you can see it larger on longer timescales, and it is different from what you from what you see from other types of variations. Okay, so basically uh, this helps separating, but it's not always easy. Indeed, it, if you remember the plot, wait, I, I can share it again, from this plot here, the Donnelly plot, there was a lot of contamination. So here, for example, okay, here you are supposed to find AGN, but there's also large contamination from star forming galaxies that are typically in this region. So this is an issue. Okay, this really is an issue. Sometimes you are good at separating them, sometimes you're not. And so it's one of the reasons why this selection is not complete. But in principle, I mean, this classifier is, is doing a good job. So at this stage, I won't worry much about that. The problem is that not all data sets are as good as this with all this coverage, all this information from other wavelengths. And so in the future, we need to deal with this eventually. I expect to have lower purity because of this contamination. So cool. If you don't mind a follow up question, it was connected to your um, black hole mass estimates. Mm -hmm. so, so they've come from all different catalogs. I was just wondering, do they use a consistent method for estimating the black hole mass? Well, um, for type 1 AGN, they are, um, you know, in each catalog, it's visual mass estimate. And the lines that they use are generally the same. So H beta, H alpha, just in some cases, and uh, magnesium 2. Sometimes they use carbon 4, but that's a tricky line. So I didn't use those estimates because it can have a shape affected by some other factors like winds. And so I didn't want to use estimates related to carbon four. But the thing is that I compared, sometimes I have more than one estimate from different catalogs. So I compared each other. I compared them to each other because I wanted to be sure that they were not very different. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the difference is um, less, in the end it's, it's, I don't remember exactly, but it's like 0.2. On a logarithmic time scale or on a logarithmic scale so it's not that bad after all the average difference okay. in some cases i have very large differences and so i um i select i preferred h beta over magnesium 2 when possible but then you can never be sure but it's just really i guess half a dozen cases with large discrepancies over 264 so it was okay yeah but that's an issue if you have different catalogs because you need to to be sure that they are consistent with each other. That's a very good point. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Demetra. Yeah, thanks. Hi. That was a really nice interesting to talk. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, with the variability and thinking about LSST, have you thought about, uh, does the cadence matter for the you know, better detection of a variable AGN? And oh, yes. Have you, all, have you all thought about that in terms of feeding back to the kind of you know, schedule for the way LSST is scheduled? Well, uh, it does matter a lot indeed. We um, did tests in one of our works in 2019, where we use always the same baseline of 3.3 years, but we select the various visits to use randomly. So not the full set of 54, but smaller sets. And we select them uh, in um, with an uneven sampling, sampling when possible, or an uneven sampling, and results were uh, were worse, basically. Even sampling is, is good, it helps, but in general, you need to have a higher cadence because uh, it allows you to retrieve more AGN. We tested this, and I mean, the results are there. If you want some details, I can provide okay. them. 
so no, no. yes this yeah. is important and we yeah we pointed it out also in uh, lsst meetings i am in the the agent science collaboration so this is one of the points i'm trying to well with the lsst we will have a, a good cadence actually so that's not really an issue okay but still it's very important yes all right thanks thank you i guess this is where we will end off our seminar so thank you once again, Dimitra, for the great talk. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was really nice to be with you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.